Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, we continue our ongoing study of Cost 313 Kingdom Culture. And by the grace of the Lord, we have covered a few grounds in the section section of the book of the of this course. The first session was to lay a foundation. And then we began with the last two lessons to consider some of the components of kingdom culture as outlined by the king of the kingdom. And by the grace of the Lord, he showed us how we need to start with poverty of the spirit, a sense of destitution. And that leads to mourning for any sinful nature of actions or attitudes that do not please our father. And then he went on to tell us the need for us to press in. And we're going to look at all that. If you go to the lecture notes, you see the four of them as the law showed us. And so what we're going to do today is to go ahead, building on what he has shown us before concerning how to live in the kingdom. You know, a king is a sovereign with authority and power. His word is authoritative. When he gives a word, it's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. His word is to be obeyed. And in this case, the Lord goes even the extra length to say, Hey, anything I want you to do, I give you power. I give you ability. I give you capacity to do it. That's the essence of Philippians 2.13. For it is Elohim who walketh in you, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. So whatever he asks us to do, he has given us the grace or capacity to do it. All he wants is the inclination of our heart. How is our heart inclined? If we are inclined to him, he releases grace to do it. And so let's go on to look at a few other things he calls components of kingdom culture. Number five, mercy. The law says the merciful shall obtain mercy. And Matthew 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So here he comes to tell us, one of, I mean, let's just get it clear. One of the most outstanding attributes of Elohim is mercy. Elohim is the spring and fountain of mercy. If you go to Psalm 103, that beautiful text tells us about Elohim, who forgives our sins, who, you know what, cleanses, heals us off from all our diseases, redeems us from destruction, and he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. Go read it for yourself. He says he pities his people. He knows our frame. So, certain things we do, knowing our frame, the Lord doesn't take a sledgehammer to, you know, beat us to nothing. And the Lord wants us to, wants to remind us that we are born again. We who are born again, we are inducted into the family of Elohim because of his mercy. Father, teach us your mercy. Be with us in this lesson. Let your name be glorified in Yeshua's name. None of us is in the kingdom because of our righteousness. We are all products of his mercy. It's because of his mercy that we are not consumed. And his mercies are new every day. And the Lord has put in us part of our own spiritual bloodstream right now is filled with that capacity of being merciful. It's in our DNA from our Father. We are not just his sons by mere description, mere words. There is something of him in us, including the ability to be merciful, to have a heart that is piteous, that looks at other people's issues, looks at their deficiencies, and tries to frame it in pity, not in harshness. You see, when we have a merciful heart, it will manifest in a number of things. One of them is that we're going to put the best construction on the attitude and action of other people. 
you know where they are coming from. It enables you not to bad mouth. No, just to give you a little bit of idea. Say, hey, temper justice with mercy, knowing where they are coming from. It will make us not to imagine or impute negative motives to other people. We're not going to be allowing our own minds to be filled with negativity and projecting that into them and supposing that it is so with them. Why? The mindset we are supposed to have is mindset of Philippians 4 verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, think on these things, think only on those things. If we guard the loins of our mind, as Peter recommended, any time a thought that is negative about another person comes in, we will know that this is not from Elohim. Elohim is not evil, cannot give us evil thoughts. We know it's an attack from the enemy. We know it's a fiery that of the wicked one. So we take the shield of faith to quench them. We wear the breastplate of righteousness to make sure that they don't penetrate. Brothers and sisters, it will make us to rather see the best in other people. We, even when they say or act in negative ways, our first instinct is to count them forgiven. That is what it means to forgive forward. First Peter 4, 8. Above all things, have fervent charity, red hot charity amongst yourself for charity shall cover the multitude of sins this attitude makes us to forgive people before they even sin against us and not to hold it brothers and sisters this is something that represents elohim we live in a world people are, where people are harsh judgmental where people want to squash destroy and the lord is saying i want my own to live on the road less traveled to walk on the opposite road, the road of mercy. And they promise those who are merciful will obtain mercy. They will obtain mercy from Elohim. Anything that happens to them, they cry to Elohim. He have mercy upon them. He forgive them. And in their dealings with other people, whether saved or unsaved, mercy will be exalted above their failings. James 2 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that showeth no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. It's so important to understand, if you are merciful, you pity. If you are merciful, you seek to put the best contrition on other people. If you are merciful, you cover their failings with your love. If you are merciful, the Lord says, mercy will come back to you. You obtain mercy. No one will be permitted to deal harshly with you, including the pharaohs. Nobody. Because it's a spiritual principle. The Lord is calling us to rediscover the power of mercy, to covet it and to grow in it, and to be merciful. And that will make us stop all the harsh, judgmental attitude towards one another in the household of faith. Then number six, the pure in heart will see Elohim. This is another component of kingdom culture. Verse Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, but they shall see Elohim. Those who are pure in heart are indeed blessed people. We live in a world of wickedness. We live in a world where, you know, there's so much evil imagination, evil hearts, evil thoughts. Why? The heart of humans is generally impure and is the spring and source of all evil thoughts, all evil attitudes, all evil actions. Because the heart is the heart of the matter. So in Matthew 12, 24, he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good measure, treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. And Matthew 15, that theme is also repeated in verse 18. 
But those things which proceed out of the mouth, they come forth from the heart. They defile the man, for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defile not a man. Natural man is filled with negativity so much. The heart is the spring and source of all evil. And only the Lord knows the true heart. Only Him knows the motive why people do what they do. He hasn't given it to us. And getting into that, even thinking is discernment, can get us into danger when we become mind readers. When we become mind readers and heart readers, we are taking a seat belonging to Elohim Himself. In Psalm 44, 21, shall not Elohim search this out, for he knoweth the secrets of the hearts. Only him. He knows the deepest secrets in the hearts of people. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the very reins, even to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of Elohim is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of, uh, and marrows, and is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature which is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him which whom we have to do. So the Lord has more provision for mortal man to be pure in heart. Yeah. This wickedness, this negativity in the heart that inspires wars and you know, robberies and murders and all manner of evil, the Lord has made provision for those who are his own to get out of it. Level one is through the new birth experience. When we are told in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Yeshua, is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's level one. There's a level two. And in level two, it's true, we've seen it before in this course, the sanctification of our entire being, spirit, soul, and body, by himself. That's what we said in First Thessalonians chapter 5, we say in verse 23, the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray Elohim for your whole spirit and soul and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. So, what is it about the pure heart the Lord wants us to bear in mind today? Brothers and sisters, listen to this. The pure heart is conscious of the omniscience and omnipresence of Elohim. He is conscious of his immanence. He is everywhere. He knows everything about us. Because of this, the saints know fully well that Elohim knows what is in his heart at all times. And armed with a positive mindset, of Philippians 4 8, it means that the believer gets into the life of spiritual warfare as a lifestyle, not to look for enemies, to make sure there is no pollution inside. So, one, he wears the breastplate of righteousness among the armor, whole armor of Elohim. The breastplate protects the heart. Any arrow, any bullet coming, it touches the breastplate, it bounces off. It doesn't penetrate. Then the helmet of salvation wears it always to protect the mind, area, and the brain. How we think, how we reason. Then the shield of faith takes it, carries it up forward when the enemy throws those fiery darts, that brother, that sister, that man, that woman. You take the shield of faith and shut it out. Because once the arrows penetrate, pollution will come. Once the arrows penetrate, the next thing is pollution. So, brothers and sisters, you guard the purity the Lord gives to you. You guard it. it is, though Elohim is the one who purifies the heart of his own with the blood of Yeshua, 
and the sword of the spirit, they do not take it for granted. They wage effective spiritual warfare. Even in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 6, the same principle as, you know, Ephesians 6. So, you cast down every imagination and every height that exhausts itself against the knowledge of Elohim that comes into your heart concerning anyone, any person. So, what is the motivation that leads us to seek purity? True saints are to live this way because of the high esteem they have of Elohim, who is holy and charges his own to be holy. First Peter 1, 15 and 16, as he who has called is holy, be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So you keep the heart. You recognize this is the place. If you lose it here, you've lost it. External actions, if they are okay, but you lost it in the heart, you've lost it. So you guard it, you keep it, you don't want it to be impure. You rather every time you check up anything, any abrasion thereof, you go to the Lord to do it. Sanctification is not supposed to be a historic experience. I was born again, so and they sanctified and they filled with Holy Spirit. What of now? The Lord wants us to live in currency of these experiences to make sure we come that it doesn't matter. You don't allow negative thoughts to dwell in us for anything under the sun. There will be a thousand excuses the enemy will bring our way. We refuse, knowing that if we are polluted inside, before Elohim, we are filthy. We don't want to play hypocrite, pleasing to men. So we guard our heart with all diligence. And whatever the Lord does in it, we do not let it go. And part of it is a conscious a conscious decision not to allow evil thoughts and imaginations to come into us concerning other people. It doesn't matter what we see. It doesn't matter what we hear. And once we have this attitude, we are in line for the promise of the Lord. The promise is that they shall see Elohim. The pure in heart shall see him. So how can we see him? In this present time, we see him in all situations. And that's why we can stay in perfect peace. Like Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In this present time, we can take our hearts and mind to stay on him and to receive his assurance that it is well. So in the midst of situations, it is well comes into us because our mind is stayed on him. Our heart is stayed on him. Then we see him also in prayer because when you communicate in prayer, it's your heart, our heart, the Lord is looking for. And therefore, we make sure at all times our heart is wrapped up around him. We take trips to the heavenly realm. We report for duty before our king. What are we going to do? We are not asking for his permission to force him to do what we want. No, our heart beat is Matthew 6, 10, thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. So we are basically saying, hey, Lord, I want to be a midwife of your will. I want to pray your will. I want to stay on your will. Not my will, but yours, O Elohim. So we see him in prayer. Men and brethren, there is also a dimension of seeing him which is in the world to come. So how does it happen? If we are alive, the time of the trumpet, we are raptured up. If we finish our pilgrimage and go to rest in him, you know what? On the day of the trumpet sound, we participate in the first resurrection. Then we, number two, we participate in the, in the great, you know, the, the judgment seat of Yeshua, where we go for assessment of how we did what he asked us to do. Three, we enjoy the pleasures of heaven for a season about seven years of seeing the glories of heaven. Number four, the marriage supper of the Lamb where the whole body, the church is, that spiritual banquet, the marriage feast between Yeshua and his body, we participate in it in Revelation 19. Five, we return with Yeshua to come to vanquish the armies of the Antichrist who are gathered to destroy Israel at the battle of Armageddon. 
6. When Satan is bound for a thousand years, we're going to rule and reign with Yeshua's co hairs over the earth rim for a thousand years. 7. Endless eternity with our Father. As we are told in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And Revelation chapter 21. Men and brethren, Revelation 21 says, When the new heavens and earth, you say, verse 3, Revelation 21, verse 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. He wipe away tears from their eyes, there shall be no more death, neither any more sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Endless eternity with Elohim. Seek is profitable to walk with a pure heart. It's profitable in this world. It's profitable in the world to come. And the Lord said, this is the culture of my kingdom. My kingdom is opposite to the world. The world gets by by striving, struggling, pulling down, downgrading, down bitching, speaking evil, imagining evil, and all strife and confusion. He said, mine is a different way of life. Let's take the, the last one for today. Number seven, the, peak, the peacemakers will be called the children of Elohim. He said in Hebrew, uh, Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. So here, peacemakers, what about peacemaking? Number one, peacemaking between us and Elohim. As human beings, if you are not yet in the kingdom, you need to have peace made between you and Elohim. And for those who have come into the kingdom, the Lord commits to us the ministry of reconciliation, being instruments of making peace between him and his children that are lost. Be people who will reach out, who will invest our time, invest skills, invest whatever he puts in us as instruments of looking for others who are yet outside, bringing them near, and those who are saved, discipling them so that they and, the, and their Savior are on the same page and they are following him. They are not just believing on him, they are following him. And in that case, peace is made between them and him. And brothers and sisters, making peace also between humans and humans who have issues, who have issues. It could be among believers, like Paul did with Onesimus and Philemon. Being one, the law uses to bring people together, patch up relationships. You see, we live in a world where everybody is taking advantage of every situation. Everybody take advantage of any rift between people. He goes in to make the rift bigger so that he can now have a portion that he wants. Let's say, no, not us. We are people who make peace. First, peace with us and Elohim. Two, peace with people and Elohim. Then three, people, peace with people. People make peace, live in peace. Peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the evidence of the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We should, be, we should have so much quantum of peace in us that we are instruments of making Goshen a land of peace. In the midst of the troubles in the world, Yeshua said, you have, in the world you shall have trouble, but in me you shall have peace. We become carriers of that peace. When we contribute to things, it's not to create more confusion, it's to make peace. Peace, wherever there is problem. Men and brethren, only those who have enjoyed peace with Elohim have the capacity to operate in all these dimensions of making peace. And there's a promise that they shall be called the children of Elohim. Why? Is the Elohim of peace. So anywhere you see somebody live in this way, definitely, anybody see will know, it's because there's a DNA of the Father in that person. And the Lord is saying to us, children of the Most High, the Lord is saying to us, the key ways of the kingdom are different from the ways of the world. And the Lord say, hey, you know what? As these teachings are going on, let's check up. Let's allow Holy Spirit to do a work with them in our lives so that whatever is not profitable, we can release it out 
and incline our hearts to seek him, to ask him to take over. So it's no longer about us. The driving seat of our lives, we give up. So that our king stays there and from there. He who is the prince of peace, as he dwells there, what will come out of our vessels, things that make for peace. So we don't want anything so much, so much so that we are just, you know, being instruments of causing confusion. No. The things of Elohim are mapped out. He's an Elohim of peace. Let's follow the path of peace. Let's enjoy his peace in our hearts. If there's no peace in the heart, if there's no peace in the mind, there's something. It's either there's a controversy that we have with him without our knowing it. Or the Lord is trying to draw attention. And the Lord says, give me an opportunity to take you through and imbibe in you the culture of my kingdom that is different from that of the kingdoms of this world. And with these things, brothers and sisters, we come to the end of this for today. And then tomorrow, by the grace of the Lord, you know, we continue the other things about the culture of the kingdom. So by way of assignment, will you tell us what the Lord ministered to you about um, the fifth component of kingdom culture here, which is today, he said to us, mercy. What did you receive from this? Don't just go to us. What did you receive? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Number two, what do you receive of the purity in heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim. What did you receive? And then number three, what we just discussed about peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. What did you receive? And then number two, I mean number four, what will you do with these lessons? These things the Lord is releasing. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, the great I am who I am. How excellent is your name, O oh Lord. We come to your throne of grace now. We come asking you to have your way. Release grace for us to, Father, continue this study. Understand this study. Release grace for us to take it seriously, to prayerfully ask you for your grace. And Father, I also ask for grace for everyone who is in this class to share and to you know, keep the conversation going so that kingdom culture is what fills the atmosphere everywhere. Help us also in the Bible reading plan every day that none of us will miss it. Do what you want to do amongst your children this year. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.